Yeah, no problem. So, um, but just as I put my slides up here, uh, what I'm going to focus on is some of the technical technical aspects of building a program because I think a lot of people um, really don't think about that at all until you start to get into a position where you have no choice but to think about it. So, does everybody see one slide or two, or neither? None. None. No slide. Okay, we can't see. Let me try something different. Probably. Danger. Probably. There we go. Now. How about now? That's good. Yeah, okay. So, um, this is, uh, as I said, going to be about some of the technical aspects that people really don't think about until they are in, at least here, in their kind of last three weeks of training and wandering out the door and uh, realizing that where they're going doesn't have any of this stuff set up and how are they going to do it. So um, there's a lot of detail to how to put it together, but this is just an overarching view. So starting a program. So one of the things that's really, 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 really important that you need to do ideally actually before you even go um, to whatever new program you uh, decide to go to is you need to figure out who your key stakeholders are. And those need to be at least uh, the leadership within neonatology and the leadership within cardiology. Um, and then when you get there, um, one of the things to do really early is really try to put down on paper what you feel like your program um, will look like going forward, whether that's the same as the program that you came from uh, or something slightly different to work in that uh, new institution that you're in. And remembering that every institution has a culture and so every culture is a little bit different. And you go to that with a with a plain uh, piece of paper with some ideas on it and really engage your cardiology partners in how your program can fit in with their program uh, and then build it out as a pilot, pilot it, and then go back um, a couple of months later and say, well, is this really working? Does this workflow work for us? Um, are we able to get in touch with the people we need to get in touch with when we're uh, encountering them. So I think that's a really early planning step that's really important. And for those who are in the US, one of the uh, things that uh, is important to consider, this is less relevant in Canada, but still kind of important, is this concept of relative value units. And many of you will know about this. Basically, it's just a point system to judge productivity. And when you're talking about um, my money and programs and building programs, it oftentimes boils down to who's going to bill, where's this going to live, um, and how is it going to work. So. Uh, one of the secrets is that it's not worth it to a hemodynamics person to quibble over the RVUs for an echo. Uh, it, it's points, yes, but it's a tiny amount of points in the grand scheme of things. And it gives you a way to give a gift to your cardiology colleagues to say, um, here, you be our champion, kind gift of all this productivity to you, uh, even though we're doing a lot of the work. And then as you move things forward, that becomes um, something that you can talk about splitting down the line, but it's not something to quibble about at the beginning. Uh, some other keys of going into talking to your Echo Lab colleagues is they have an accreditation, whether they're in the US or in Canada or everywhere else in the world. Um, Echo Labs and cardiologists are being looked at by someone outside to say, are you compliant with XYZ rules? And so anytime you're building a relationship with them, it's important to remember that somebody's watching them too. And how does it to, how does your group fit in to make sure you don't compromise whatever that is for them? Um, and it's also really good to identify one or maybe a couple uh, champions within cardiology because um, we do things a bit different than they do. And so it can be jarring for them to either review our images or re regularly review our protocols. And if they're not familiar with it, um, it can be challenging. So one of the things that we learned um, both in Toronto and starting the program here is it's a lot easier when one person uh, or two people are familiar with your protocols, are familiar with how you operate, bring them along with you sometimes, let them see what you do, 
um, and go to them if you have questions or you have uh, funny things that you find, you have anatomic heart disease that you're not sure whether you can rule it out. Um, and that person can really become kind of for people can become kind of part of your team. And so when you're working together to problem solve things, you're working together together um, and you're one group. And that helps uh, helps to navigate a lot of the politics um, and also helps to navigate a lot of the technical issues and their reward is the RVU. So it's of benefit to them in a lot of different ways and a place for you also to get mentorship from an imaging perspective. Um, this is a this is what I call equipment non negotiables so I've told a lot of people about this but and so has Patrick and mentioned that I was going to talk a little bit more about it, but absolutely without any question. Um, one of your negotiating things has to be a machine of your own uh, and echocardiography um, caliber, not a point of care ultrasound machine, an actual echo machine, um, and the reason for that is because borrowing uh, is not only a huge unnecessary headache, but it's also sometimes dangerous because some of what we need to do is not, uh, doesn't allow you to have 15, 20, 30 minutes to figure out where the echo machine is in cardiology that you can borrow. It doesn't allow you to say, I'm only gonna scan on Mondays and Fridays. Um, there are things that need to be done right now and it can be dangerous if you don't have access to uh, your own equipment. It's also inefficient sometimes because if you're, if you're doing serial scans on a sick baby, that ties up a machine for hours that cardiology probably can't afford to give you for hours. And so it's a hassle on both sides. You also then are in control of your own upkeep and maintenance and depending on your um, group, that can be more or less important. The other thing that's not negotiable, especially if you're wanting to do uh, research, is that you need your own echo pack with its own computer. This is not that expensive and it uh, should be the newest version um, and it should uh, live on a computer, ideally with an expanded hard drive, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and don't forget service contracts when you're talking about equipment. It's part of the package of equipment that every five years uh, they come and um, upgrade something. Every one year they come and clean stuff. It, uh, it's just something that people forget to negotiate in the original contract that they have. Um, and again, I do not work for or get any money or favors from GE, um, but I do recommend their equipment. Uh, and the, there are a few reasons for that. One is obviously uh, that most of us are using, uh, especially in North America, most of us are using GE equipment, which makes it a lot easier to do cross uh, institutional research because we're all analyzing that on the same platform and you don't need to worry about cross platform validation of things like strain and all of that. Um, it also has the best uh, offline image analysis, and the company actually has some investment in neonates. Uh, it validates uh, many of the analysis modalities against cardiac MR, and we have connections with people who do the, the uh, improvement work on these machines. And so there's ways to collaborate uh, that are not uh, available in other uh, large institutions. So. Um, if you if you do have influence over your own machine uh, and what it's going to look like, I recommend a GE and I can provide you with more information um, about uh, cost of contracts if you want. But do you really need the fanciest of machines? And I really don't think so. I think that as long as your echo pack is modern and um, something that's as old as an E9, which would be kind of from 2015-16 um, era is probably okay. Uh, the actual imaging technology is a little bit better now, but it's not so much better that the equipment is not usable anymore. Um, Obviously, uh, the E90 is the newer version and the one on the uh, in the second panel here. Um, but do you need an E95? Probably not. The only thing that that adds is 40. Um, and we actually don't, uh, the, the software and hardware for doing uh, 3D imaging on neonates is really not good enough to spend the extra money on it at this point. And you can always upgrade later. Um, so uh, some key features um, of your a program that you're building, uh, some of the easiest things to think about. So archive your exams wherever cardiology archives them. That's the easiest and most transparent way to do, to do it. They've already figured out how to get everything into the EMR, just do like they did. Um, and there's, whether they're on GE or not, there are ways to do that. Um, 
then the second phase is that you want, you're wanting to generate data for yourself, maybe to do clinical research or to create educational content for people. So to do that, you have to have a second place to archive, or ideally you have a second place to archive that gives you the ability to keep your DICOM and raw data together, which means that you have um, all of the post-processing capabilities uh, that come with uh, everything that goes with Echopack. If your uh, hospital is Philips, uh, or even sometimes if your hospital is GE and they don't have the settings set up so that they actually keep the raw data, then you lose all of that later on. Um, so you, if you have a second network corner to store your stuff in, uh, that's the ideal way to do it. And Echopack can manage all of that as your database um, until your program gets to be about 60 scans a week. Uh, so if you get there, come back and see me and I'll tell you what you need to expand to. But you don't really need to spend any more money than that um, until you get to be pretty darn big. Um, and this is my uh, example of an IT team. So um, what, until you start to get into the process of really uh, putting together the IT piece that is important for program building, you don't realize that there's all these different types of IT people. Uh, the fact of the matter is that IT is very complicated and um, IT infrastructure in a hospital is one of the biggest uh, departments. So uh, your specialists will not look like my specialists. Probably your Epic specialist is not just drinking coffee. They're actually probably doing something. Um, but the, the groups here are, you have workstation people. So they uh, deal with firewalls and administrative rights and software on computers. There are radiology engineering people. So these people deal with machines, network hardware. Uh, there are specific software specialists for echo uh, technology. They do servers, also firewalls, hospital software, backend integration, all of this stuff. And then there's the Epic guy with the coffee. So um, all of this uh, is also supported by GE or whoever, if you don't decide to go with GE, whoever your remote support um, happens to be. It really makes a lot of sense when you're setting up your program to identify champions in these groups, get to know them um, so that they understand what you're doing. And so you can keep going back to them uh, to troubleshoot things, add new things, figure out software things. When they upgrade the whole hospital and your network no longer works, uh, you know who you're talking to and they know, oh, this Echo Pack business, uh, they've heard of it before. So then you're, now your program is set up. You've got your stuff all integrated. So cardiology, you can see your images, you can see theirs. Uh, you have an Epic note built, you have an order built, um, you're ready to start scanning. Uh, so what should you do? So Number one, uh, sure, start with the acute things. That's really easy, low-hanging fruit and a place where you can really make a difference, but also consider choosing a QI focus. And one of the things that uh, we did here at Iowa um, is that uh, Patrick decided that PDA screening was a really good place to start. And so we uh, got together with the whole faculty, talked about what we might do, talked about making a plan to do things systematically differently with respect to, to PDA, which didn't really have a system before, and introduced a system and then used that as a big QI project so that we were um, systematically generating data, but also making a change to clinical practice so that people learned what our program was, how things got in, uh, how things work, uh, the nurses got to know us, there was a defined indication, um, and we kind of learned how to integrate things, and then we built out to bigger QI projects. Um, you really have to learn how to communicate well, both within the EMR and also human to human, because you're providing information that people never had before, and they need to, people in your group need to learn how to integrate that into their practice pattern that they've had before, um, and how to kind of reframe uh, their thinking around some new things that you're giving them. And in order to do that, everybody does that at their own pace and with their own style. And so you have to be be a provider of information uh, that fits in uh, with a variety of different styles of understanding. Um, and you're also there to teach and empower. So your, new, your information is new, not only to your faculty colleagues and the fellows, but it's new to the nurses, it's new to the RTs, it's new to the pharmacists, um, it's new to everybody. And so um, you can take advantage of um, 
of teaching people things, but you have to also take advantage of it within the whole team or, or it's going to be hard to gain momentum and consensus. Uh, things that you need to uh, document um, each consult, it needs the echo results and the recommendations documented somewhere, presumably in a note. It needs the imaging stored somewhere. And in the US, you need an order, a consult note, and an associated charge. Um, so that's those are kind of the nuts and bolts of getting started. But also thinking about documenting on a bigger scale to help your to help you and your program grow, it's important to keep track of certain things from the beginning. Cons your, your boss is going to ask you sometime, oh, you had this program for a year. How's it going? Um, are, you, are you getting bigger? Are you, are you um, getting capturing the patient population that you intended to capture? And if you don't track that information from the beginning, it's really big pain to go back and try to justify your program um, retrospectively. So a database of consults really helps that indications, volumes, um, and other, uh, another system to document what you're doing is really beneficial to build from the beginning. And then back up, back up, back up, so that if somebody accidentally deletes the hard drive or spills water on the computer or uh, kicks it over, uh, you still have all of your files. And then last but not least, education. So I mentioned this a little bit, but um, when you're building a new program, not just starting a new program, it's really key to think about um, how your information can be beneficial to all of those that you intersect. I mentioned the allied health professionals already, but you're also interacting and intersecting with med many other medical groups, surgery, nephrology, pulmonology, neurology. So it's not just cardiology that um, has some relationship with your systems. And so teaching all of those people as you come along can really help. Um, and also do some topic specific education for trainees and uh, if you build something like a combined rounds with cardiology, you can have them present sometimes you present sometimes and then it's by education by you of others, and also education of you by others and so it's mutually beneficial on both sides. That's it. <laughs>